Fight! Yeah. We are here. Hey, what's up? It's fight night. Round two. We have the SFX. And a new upstart is coming at the king. However, we are 10 years prior and uh, 15 years prior, if you're talking about the first time that this essay was delivered. But Derrida pits himself against King Foucault, his old teacher. It sounds like a Dragon Ball Z name, actually, a little bit. Can't say I was ever much of a Dragon Ball Z dude. I mean, if you called him King Foucault, it would work, it would work even better. Well, I don't know if you guys are using the copy that I'm using, but this is uh, Writing Indifference, Chapter 2. Otherwise, you can find it as the Kogido and the History of Madness. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah same. So this is Fight Night Round 2, where we pit one philosopher's criticisms against another, try to give the best case for it. Last week, we did Baudrillard and Foucault from 1977. This is Derrida against Foucault, 1967, from a lecture that he gave in 1963 at the ripe age of 33 years old, early 30s. Fucking precocious bastard. Yep. Yep. Last week seemed, it went to the judges, the patrons. What did they think? They, they gave it to Baudrillard. I think all the ones that decided to uh, throw their score in. But I don't think that was decisive as much as this one. This one, to me, felt like a knockout. Like, I, I forgot Foucault yeah. after reading this <laughs> essay. Yeah, yeah, I kind of agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, we have yet to uh, speak in Foucault's defense, actually. We've really been on the offensive quite a bit. That's true. Next, next week. He'll defend himself next week in a paper that he wrote against or back against Derrida defending be, himself uh, but i've never read that one to be fair i've always found it is easier to criticize someone than to put forward an original idea of your own and obviously derrida and bojara both put forward very original ideas of their own but at this point they're just especially taking pot shots at the master so i think it is important to take that keep that in mind right well, didn't uh, i hear this essay was the first one where he drops the concept of difference in in print one of the first print moments where he is. does that I think it is. I noticed so this, it in there, and he didn't explain it at all. But we should say that Foucault at this point had only published one of his major texts, which was, uh, help me out here, what was it? A History of Madness. His, and History age. of Madness. So he's not God Foucault yet. He's still uh, King Foucault. working his way up the up the ladder, <laughs> Foucault. He's Prince. He's Prince Foucault Prince right Foucault. now. He's, Prince he's, Foucault. Still, yeah. he's still heir to the throne, you know, because he's still got Sartre running around. That guy needs to be taken down a peg. He's probably got Levi Strauss, who was uh, kind of like the king of structuralism in the 60s before uh, Derrida also had his way with him in, uh, what was it, 1968? And uh, I think we actually might have, did we read that essay? Uh, I mean, g given wrote? Foucault's propensity to like BDSM, saying have his way with him, conjures a lot of interesting imagery there. Well, uh, we already know that Foucault's it. sexuality does not exist because Baudrillard told us last week. That's right. Oh, yeah. We we read uh, Derrida's essay earlier on, um, what was it, on, on structure and difference or something. That The essay he wrote specifically for that 68 conference where um, Levi Strauss was sort of the guest of honor and he was presenting his big sort of structuralist paradigm and Derrida kind of wrote this, I think it was like an inaugural address or something like that in 68, and he kind of laid out post-structuralism there. And you, you can almost see the seeds of it in here. I, I actually recognized some of the turns of phrase he was using in this essay. Yeah, and you can see his strategy develop here too. It's pick out, pick out a few lines that he thinks are supposedly on the margins of the text, and then reading the whole rest of the text through that little marginal comment what, what's interesting about this too is um eric and i were talking about this in the chat is how much weight um he puts on foucault's interpretation of descartes uh and normally that would be fairly trivial since obviously you know you kind of hone in on a great thinker that you assume people would be familiar with in order to kind of raise relevant points but i think import it's important to situate this historically since this is the moment in French philosophy, and I suppose you could say um, European or Western, whichever you prefer, philosophy as a whole, 
uh, where the Cartesian subject really comes under fire from all directions. You know, the shots had been fired before by the Heideggers, the Hegels, the Nietzsche's, whoever you want before. But by this point, almost everybody starts to decide that we need to do away with this in one way, shape or form. Uh, and so I think it's really interesting that both of them are kind of wrestling with Descartes' legacy uh, in these texts. And they ascribe such significance to that. But neither of them uh, seems willing to endorse what it is that Descartes was trying to do. Even if I think Derrida, interestingly, is a little bit more friendly to Descartes than Foucault was. Yeah, I, I this was written in the early 60s, 63, when he first uh, gave it as a lecture. But I find that today I have not done that. I used to do it and I have not done it for about five years. But I hate when people just bring up Descartes to do, take some pot shots and be like, oh, it's not like the whole world doesn't exist. Not like Descartes thinks. Mm. We're not doing mind-body dualism. Which if you read Descartes or Husserl on Descartes, that was even that wasn't even the point of of the meditations. No, but I mean, like Zizek said this in the Tickler subject. I think it was 1997, uh, where he said he was bored of the whole debate over the philosophy of the subject and Cartesian um, rationality. He said everybody now doesn't believe in it. Uh, everyone just assumes it's a kind of bygone paradigm. So of course Zizek, being Zizek, is like, I'm going to bring it back. You know, I'm going to make it sexy again. So I think we've all moved past the kind of debate a little bit. Sure. Uh, where most people will accept that there are huge problems with the Cartesian cogito ego sum, uh, but you won't see people attacking it as venomously as maybe they once would have. Um, yeah. So yeah. anyway, I think it's just important yeah. to be, take note of that since you know there's there's sure. a reason why it is that they're both battling over his legacy so intensely. It's of historical interest, I think. Well, if you've been to grad school, and I know you have, it's a shorthand for things I don't like. Is Cartesian subject. <laughs> if there's something wrong with the world, yeah, it's Cartesian rationality. What was the old phrase? You know, from Plato to NATO through Descartes, right? Sure. I mean, I feel like Descartes is not even really like the boogeyman anymore in in, in philosophy departments. It's more like I don't know uh, what's it called, uh, logical positivism or something. Is like the straw man that people like to uh, be put, put oh, yeah. themselves in opposition to now. I mean that that started up really in the in the 90s with the science wars, where positivism was in direct right, opposition right, right. to the new social constructivist methods but you, in the in the history of philosophy I, I think Rorty said something like this or to this effect is that after Descartes it's all really just either a position on or against Descartes but that, that's what I wanted us to ask just to like preempt this because Eric I know you have your problems with Descartes I know that I have my problems with Descartes having read Heidegger uh, but before we you know before we dive into this text, Anybody want to say something about Descartes that they think is interesting, or do they draw anything from the? Cartoon? Let's go around the circle and say one nice thing. Yeah, well, what just, just like? so that you know, we offer an all branch to it because I, I actually think what's interesting about this text to me, and I'll explain why, is that I actually expected that Derrida would have been much more critical of Descartes um, than Foucault would have, uh, and yet I think his interpretation is a lot more charitable, and it kind of sets the tone for his work going forward because. For all Derrida has put forward as this kind of boogeyman uh, of Western civilization, just deconstructing everything, he is known for the kind of charity of his readings uh, of a lot of figures. You know, he really loved the history of philosophy, and he rarely just goes in to trash somebody, uh, except for Foucault in this case. Well, he wrote at the, there's a quotation in the last couple pages here, and he says, uh, Foucault's reading is naive. Yeah. So and from Foucault, Foucault took offense to that, of course, because Foucault takes offense to everything. He's kind of a bitch that way he didn't talk to Derrida for 20 years until uh Derrida was arrested on a charge of weed possession actually in Prague bad boy <laughs> Wrong. Really? I mean what a bastard considering all the weird fucked up shit that was going in on in Czechoslovakia at that time I can't believe that that was what they decided to focus on but whatever and we should mention yeah. also that uh Derrida was Foucault's student about five years before this. And he writes that at the beginning, I am the disciple trying to uh, come at the master. I like the idea of Derrida smoking weed, though. It's, it's kind of nice to think about. So let me just answer that question about, <clears throat> about Descartes. I guess I would say that Descartes is like a fun person to start undergrad philosophy with because you yeah. get to ask fun questions about like skepticism and how sure you can be about knowledge and it's like a good way to set the stage for an undergrad yeah. philosophy class yeah i agree with that i mean descartes method was was revolutionary and 
it i mean they they say in the history of philosophy one of the one of the best things descartes ever did was to get everyone to stop reading the scholastics <laughs> and to stop <laughs> that's true yeah using the authorities the combined authorities of the church and a christianized aristotle to answer every single question like use your own reason use logic think for yourself like in a way derrida or not derrida uh, uh descartes message was like a proto version of that you know you use the light of your own reason to work out issues don't rely on the church fathers and the ancient authorities because the and and almost as if to to uh justify this opinion you know galileo overturns the whole institution of aristotelian physics soon <laughs> after and you have the enlightenment getting going and you know here we are today with descartes sort of at the very very beginning of that movement so you know whatever bad things you can find to say about descartes i mean he was a pivotal figure quite brilliant even if he wrote his philosophy alone locked in a room with that had to be like a very specific temperature that's not true satan was there remember yeah no satan could have been there a church could have been there he he was a he was a phenomenally important figure in history and yeah i agree also with victor okay this is supposed to be fight night so let's fast yeah, forward from the uh early 17th century 30 years war let's fast forward to uh post heidegger where the biggest insult is you're doing metaphysics no you're doing metaphysics and in this essay Derrida accuses Foucault of doing metaphysics. Then there's Deleuze, who's like, "Fuck yeah, I'm doing metaphysics. What are you gonna do about it?" Yeah, I was just gonna say. Yeah, I was so I, well. That I mean, that brings up the question because you know I didn't, uh, I haven't read the Foucault uh, text that's being referenced here, or at least not all of it. I think I read sections of it in maybe my masters, but I'm wondering if 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 anyone can clarify, right? Like, what is the use of Descartes? in Foucault that is kind of the focus. That, I feel like that'd be a good starting point, right? Like, let's get clear on what is Foucault claiming about Descartes that is then becomes the thing that Derrida ends up getting fixated on in this essay. Well, I should say, History of Madness in an Age of Civilization, the way it's usually published here, uh, is a much abridged version of the book um, that Foucault ultimately published, which was this massive tome uh, analyzing you know, the history of rationality and the transition you know, to kind of medicalized cognition that we see in modernity. Uh, you know, the History of Madness, uh, or Madness and Civilization, sorry, is usually published as like a 200-page book here. Uh, but like the fundamental thesis is really quite striking, right, which is that Reason, you know, as we understand it in the modern world, isn't something that's transparently obvious. It had to be constructed and was constructed via this long process of eventually demarcating itself from everything that becomes considered unreason. Uh, and in many ways, uh, Foucault sees Descartes as one of, if not the pivotal figures in this transition. Right? Uh, and what comes across in the book, uh, and this is why it focuses on madness, uh, is that, of course, because he's Foucault, uh, this demarcation between reason uh, and its other uh, entails the construction of a new system of power. He doesn't quite call it power knowledge yet, uh, but it's pretty clear what he's getting at, right? Uh, since, of course, the people who assume the authority to say what's reasonable also assume the authority to demarcate who's unreasonable, uh, and, of course, to police their epistemology, their ontology, their moral sensibilities, more or less everything, uh, which is why the mad becomes such a significant figure for him, right? Uh, since... They're kind of the paradigmatic, unreasonable figure who stands astride or against uh, the modernist impulse uh, to allow reason to tyrannize everything, or a certain concept of reason to tyrannize everything. And I mean, it's an Damn. overstated thesis, but I mean, you read the book, it's very classical code, it's very well written, it's very dramatic, lots of pulpy historical examples. It is an in innovative reading of Descartes, since nobody would have, I think... <laughs> ascribe that to him in quite as vivid a way uh, as he would but yeah. i think it's actually just a straight up wrong reading of descartes as this, I think so, this but, essay you know, it's, it's definitely shows but yeah i agree madness has always been only spoken about or theorized by the rational and then in this case it's instrumentalized state sanctioned psychiatry and psychiatrists uh are not seen as interpreters of madness they're seen as scientists of madness and that's Delegates where you of reason that's where you see this origin of power knowledge because they have knowledge then they are able to speak for the mad and then the mad 
Mad people, insane people, institutionalized people, on the other hand, are compelled into silence by Nurse Ratchet. So the history of madness is then the history of the silent side of this duality between reason and madness. So all right, project sounds good. Yep. Card yeah. obviously has problems with it. And That's I should say scandal. it is meticulously researched, right? Again, the little 200 page book that we get here is nothing compared to like the fucking beefy. I can't even remember how seven much or 800 is. pages long. Yeah, like it's, it's not like Foucault tossed this off on a weekend. I believe it's 673 to be exact. There you go. Like It's, it's, it's magisterial. And he makes additions to it in the 70s. <laughs> so what is so what is the claim then that's being that 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 uh, Foucault makes about Descartes and madness? Oh, that. Well, let's think back to the meditations. Anyone who's listening to this who's been through their intro to philosophy knows that Descartes goes all, through all the things that he could be wrong about that introduce doubt into thinking. So when you're dreaming. You think that you're using your senses, that you have a body, that you're seeing things. You wake up, obviously you weren't actually experiencing those things. So that introduces that little bit of doubt into it. And then De uh, Descartes, I'm going to be confusing Descartes and Derrida all day, but Descartes <laughs> D, also gives the big a- The D's. The big D's, yeah. Gives a mention to madness and says, also the mad don't know they're mad, but they think that they're seeing things. They think that they're wearing clothes that they're not wearing. They think that they're experiencing things that they're not actually experiencing. Uh, I think they we actually won mad. the 2020 election. <laughs> but we aren't mad, so we're not going to look for the nah. locus of indubitable knowledge in the mad or in dreaming people. And think, Foucault, uh, of course, takes issue with this and says Descartes is creating a binary between people who dream, a.k.a. normal people, and mad people who are abnormal, and he doesn't give abnormal people the time of day. And Derrida reads, rereads Descartes and says uh, that wasn't what he was saying at all, so you missed the point. Yeah, I wanted to I mean, reference something that Eric said, actually. So just let me go first, Eric, because I'm referring to your approach. This is the most tatest thing I'll ever say, Okay. Because uh, I also think that one of Foucault's criticisms in the book uh, is that Derrida, from his perspective, is developing a monological concept of reason and philosophy, right? That essentially he's saying it needs to be subject focused and we need to strip away everything that's associated with intersubjectivity, culture, tradition, uh, and for that matter, classical metaphysics, like you're saying, Pills, you know, all that stuff about uh, scholasticism and stuff. Uh, it has to come purely from the Cartesian ego, uh, if it's going to be rationally validated. Uh, and Foucault, being very critical of the whole paradigm of the philosophy of the subject, as taking aim at him in part for this monological um, approach, at least as he perceives it. And I think this is also important because it's something that Derrida brings up in the essay that, from his perspective, uh, Descartes isn't actually being monological since the demon is also important. Right. Yeah. Also, to be to be fair, or to put it into perspective at least, is that these like Derrida is really only focusing on a few pages of the history of madness where he sees like the entire point or essence of the book encapsulated because the parts about Descartes in history of madness do not take up a lot of space compared to the sort of breadth of the whole work. But Derrida focuses on these and builds outwards. And I, I believe actually Foucault hits him on this a little bit is to say, well, you've, you've really focused on such a small, almost like side note to my whole project is just like this, this interpretation of Descartes that I've done. But uh, I mean, that's, that's Derrida's kind of method, right? Like he finds a crack or a fissure and he sort of worms his way into it. And, and then like sooner or later, you find out that it's actually runs straight to the heart of the whole project. And that if you can get through it, you can sort of really see what's going on, all the tensions and the like main structuring arguments that the whole work is based on. So really, we're just looking at a little bit of the whole work and then using that to view the whole. Right. Yeah, that's a difference that I think if you think read works, this though. if you read this for the first time and you don't know the method that Derrida is obviously already developing at this time is it sounds nitpicky because he points to this one passage that Foucault blatantly misreads and then you might think oh he's just focusing on this part in order to criticize his reading of another philosopher 
But the point that I, Derrida is actually getting to is that the binary that Foucault is working with is ahistorical, which means that it's metaphysical. So he's idealizing and then reflecting on his own idealized vision of something that comes from outside of history. So Derrida hits him and hits him and hits him. I think it's like knockout round one. After two pages, I was like, well, this is right. But he says this: what's being set up here, similar to what Baudrillard said last week, what he's setting up here is something that speaks for all history, all time. And Foucault, despite pretending like he's taking a place as a subject in history, is not. He's defining all all history in these singular terms, and then saying that that existed the whole time. And then, yeah, of course, Derrida's critique here is that the binary that he's setting up, he just locks himself into from the get-go. From from page one, he never escapes it. And if I was, if I had written a 673-page book and someone dismantled it in in 40 pages like this. I think I'd be pre- pretty pissed too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's Derrida's way, right? He he inhabits the text. He gets at the schisms and the tensions. And he has this way of taking like brief suggestions and then pushing them to their absolute limits. And then through that, he exposes these contradictions and these irreconcilable intentions in the work. And this is the deconstructive method that Derrida takes. He does the same thing to Levi Strauss. He inhabits the work and he pushes it like past itself in a way and makes it almost eat itself. And it's really interesting because you think, well, Derrida has destroyed them. But then again, Derrida couldn't have done this if they didn't write these works. So it's kind of an ambiguous thing. Like we need Foucault, we need Levi Strauss. And in a way, he's just saying like, you know, these things I'm saying, they notice about their own texts. There's brief asides, there's moments of doubt where they actually express these things that I'm latching onto and just taking to their conclusion. And it's it's kind of a, it's a misunderstanding maybe of Derrida that he's just critical in a negative sense when he's really, he's very, very affirmative but he does it in a way that turns the work against itself. And it really mirrors what he's saying about Foucault. You know, you understand the central binary here is between reason and unreason, speech and silence, logic and madness, right? They're, they're these, these central binaries that Derrida locks into. And, you know, Foucault's gonna complain a little bit that, you, you know, it was, it's like kind of like reason, madness and dreams, you know, like there's certain relationships to doubt and unreason that I that you've glossed over but but Derrida's overall point is really hits home because it takes yeah Foucault nine years or something to even muster a response to this attack (laughs) so I want to stress one thing because we haven't talked about Derrida very often on here but one thing that Derrida is far more aware of than anybody else uh, before him at least is that he's writing and his text is historical, but also history. Everything that we know about history is textual. So we have this back and forth being like, you can never, I mean, we we know the quotation, you can never escape the text. There's not an outside text that you can relook at the text from. So he's very careful every time we make broad statements, we make grand narrative statements, we try to paint all of history into a repression of madness, which is what Foucault does in this book. Anytime you try to make your text something besides the historical book that you wrote in 1960, then he's going to take issue with it. And if you ever, this is why obviously Dara is criticized for the reasons he's criticized being there's no, there's no comprehensive truth that you can include all history in. But every time you try to make these massive claims about world history, He's going to be there to be like, sorry, you're writing a book in 1960. That book can't do that. I wanted to follow up on that because I absolutely think that that's right. That in addition to Descartes, there's kind of a further specter uh, that haunts both of these works, uh, which is the specter of Hegel and the dialectical tradition. Because one of the things that Foucault does in this book, very brilliantly, I'd say, uh, is he really is very critical of at least the classical dialectical tradition, which held that there's a kind of inner movement to history uh, where everything necessarily produces its opposite, uh, and this is how things move forward. Uh, because what you see paradigmatically in this book and all of other, uh, Foucault's other books is this idea of breaks, right? That uh, 
at, in one era, we conceived of madness uh, in this way, uh, and then we see the emergence of modernity and rationalism, and we conceived of it in a very different way, right? Uh, and what I actually think our Derrida accomplishes uh, with this text in a very prevalent way uh, is almost a kind of proto-negative dialectical reversal, where he says, if you actually read what Descartes is saying closely enough, as Eric was pointing out, uh, already from the very beginning of this Cartesian project, the seed of doubt, the capacity for it to deconstruct itself was latent within it. Uh, because, like I was saying earlier, uh, Descartes actually isn't engaged in a kind of monological, self-validating project uh, that endorses an uncritical iteration of reason, uh, because there's always this specter of the demon out there who's going to be critiquing everything that we do. Uh, and what this demonstrates in the back and forth between them is that from the very beginning, the modernist Enlightenment project had the capacity to birth a kind of hyper-skepticism of reason from the product productions of reason itself. Uh, and this is something that's also going to be picked up on by people like Nietzsche when he says Christianity was going to deconstruct itself, by Heidegger when he says Western technology is going to deconstruct itself. Uh, and now Derrida, as Eric was pointing out, is pointing out that we need to appreciate this dynamic going on when we try to appreciate the Cartesian project. And it's something that Foucault can't do because he's so insistent on periodizing a break between the way we conceived of madness and reason before and the way we conceive of it in the modern world. Um, and I find this really very refreshing because I do think Foucault sometimes does tend to like to sharply demarcate periods, right? There was pre-modernity, now modernity, and now, you know, whatever it is that we're entering into after. Um, and one of the reasons he's attractive to many people is precisely because he does have these nice clear-cut uh, distinctions in history in a way somebody like Hegel or, De or sorry, Derrida uh, don't. So that's just my take on this paper, but I really liked it. I'm 100% pro-Derrida in this one. There's a, there's a great sentence. It's just Hegel again. Always, period. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, true. From Derrida against Foucault, saying, yeah, you're trying to get out of Hegel, but you just did yeah. the same thing again, dude. Yeah. Right. So that reason is a totalizing sort of system, right? It's it's hard to escape Hegel because he's, he's systematized everything in the bathroom sink. And Foucault's kind of trying to do something new, but he gets caught up in what Derrida sees as Hegel's project. But, I mean, there's a bracing element to this writing a history of madness, right? Because yeah. if madness cannot speak for itself, then how can you write a history of it, right? So soon we learn that what Foucault is actually doing is an archaeology of madness, right? So then you, you get the difference between what a historian maybe does, what Foucault does a lot is work in the archives with texts, or you go to the sites and you excavate and you dig. And instead of reading, you have to look at the traces and the marks and you have to look at the physical, you know, the, the physical archive rather than the uh, textual archive, as maybe Derrida would later sort of call it, which is another kind of text, really. You're playing you're you're, you're giving up one text for another. But for some reason, in, in Foucault's mind, archaeology, this method of excavation from the ha history is a better way of talking about silence. Because when we get into the classical age of reason, which I, I believe, like I'm not sure of the whole turns of the argument, but this classical age of reason was re resurrected in the medieval era. And really, again, with Descartes, I'm guessing, and the idea is that reason excludes madness here. And, and I don't know, we can look at the quote that Derrida points out that Foucault's interpreting in Descartes, right? So after that paragraph, Pills described about the senses being deceptive, so why would we trust something that has deceived us before? But he says, it may be that although the senses sometimes deceive us concerning things that are hardly perceptible or very far away, there are many others that we cannot reasonably doubt. How could I doubt that my hands and my body are mine? Were it not perhaps that I compare myself to certain persons devoid of sense, whose cerebella are troubled and clouded by violent vapors of black bile. He's using Hippocratic language to describe madness here. He says these people, they this is the key thing, they are mad, and I should not be any less the insane were I to follow examples so extravagant. And he's talking about like crazy people, you know, who think they're pumpkins or think they're made of glass, who think they're kings when they're really paupers and that sort of thing thing and, and and Descartes kind of himself he sets up a question here it's like okay so from a reasoned perspective the senses deceive me so sometimes so why would I trust something that's deceived me before but then I look at these crazy people 
And I think, but I don't want to be like them either, thinking that I'm made of glass or thinking I can have out-of-body experiences or whatever else these people think. So where does that leave us? And Foucault has one way of interpreting this, and Derrida, you know, throws shade at that big time. So let's go back to the beginning. We're we're kind of we're kind of hasting. But that's that's just the Descartes moment right. that Foucault picks up on and that Derrida zones in on. Right. Right at the beginning, um, I just wanna here's here's Foucault's sort of motive is that in the history of philosophy, reason has always been spoken for. And it's always philosophers as speaking subjects that are saying, here's the reasonable way. And they say what's rational by contrasting it with what's insane. So that's what he, what Descartes did in his mind. He said, while I'm on my way to finding the thing that can't be doubted, um, step two basically is going to be throwing crazy people aside because obviously they're not rational. Then the whole rest of the Foucault book is saying... Uh, or tracing a history, an archaeology of here's where we privileged, we could say, privileged rationality over insanity. And insanity is always being pushed aside, the secondary term. So doing an archaeology is, is Foucault putting himself up there saying, I'm going to speak for the silent because the, the crazies have always been silenced and I'm going to speak for them now. Now, the I, very I first objection to that, bit, the very first objection to that from Derrida is, if you're going to write your book in the French Academy to a whole bunch of other French academics, that's not, the, that's not you speaking for the crazy people unless you are just reintroducing the same binary that exists between crazy, not crazy. And obviously, that Derrida would never contend that that, that, that distinction is not contingent because it is contingent. But Foucault mm. writing his 673 page book about it is actually just re-silencing the crazy discourse by turning it into philosophy. And then he says, even worse, this is I think just page three or so, then you're romanticizing it. You're romanticizing unreason the way that the romantics or the way that Nietzsche did. I do want to defend Foucault a little bit, in part just to have some spice with this, because I think we all agree that this is a great paper, and on the point about Descartes, it's kind of a knockdown blow, right? Uh, that, you know, for Descartes, reason isn't self-validating or monological, and it always contained the seeds of its own kind of deconstruction, right? Uh, but one of the things I don't think you find in this paper, or really as present uh, in Derrida's work as a whole, that you do find very vividly and very powerfully in Foucault, including in this book, uh, is an account of knowledge power, uh, and the actual material consequences for the victims uh, of this kind of bifurcation. Because this is a kind of dialogue about Descartes, but it's a very minor part of the book. What's a huge part of this book is an account of, frankly, how it is that so-called madhouses or insane asylums or sanatoriums are created, and the really horrible things that they did to people in there. Uh, and it's presented in a very affective way by Foucault, where he says, look, what the psychiatrists assume they had the right to do was to decide not just who is has a medical problem, which isn't such a bad thing. Uh, they made themselves the arbiters of what is epistemically correct. Uh, and they can essentially say that your brain doesn't function properly enough because you just don't see the way that the world really is. Uh, and they were able to get institutional validation for this, right? Uh, and to coercively apply their standards to pretty much the rest of the world, at least the, West of the rest of the Western world. Uh, and mm -hmm. I do think that that's a really powerful kind of description uh, of something that occurred that you miss uh, if you just focus on these philosophical points. Uh, and I think it's important to foreground that since, as Pill said to me uh, last week, you know, to be a leftist is to be a materialist. And Foucault, I think, is a somewhat better materialist in his account of madness uh, than somebody like Derrida is, at least on the subject as a whole. Yeah, we should. I mean, yeah, being being compassionate towards people with mental illness. I mean, that could, I I mean that's that's the least philosophical way I would probably put yeah. the point of Foucault's text cuz before this, right? And maybe in the metaphysical sort of perspective, you know, madness was always viewed, I mean, I don't know about the divine part, but always as a moral failing upon the individual. Yeah. And this is why I like 
Deleuze and Guattari so much on this point as well, is that madness and deviance are actually social diseases that we can address and that don't implicate the individual in a certain way, right? Like they're diseases of capitalism, they're diseases of industry and institutionalization more so than they are, like these people just need to be contained, like in Bedlam where they would just chain people to the walls, right? Like that, that was a horrible way. I think even on a basic yeah. level, we can say that's a horrible way of dealing with people who are having these kinds of difficulties. But that was the normalized kind of approach. And I mean, it's hard to emphasize how like crude medicine was even at the time Derrida and Foucault were writing. It was pretty crude. It was full of snobs. It was careerist. And it was just all around horrible. And we shouldn't ever treat people that way, neither in our philosophies nor in our daily lives. It's crazy sure, is, to me. Is, is the que is the que uh, so I'm curious. So is the main critique then, so I think like we can all agree with what Matt and Eric just said, you know, about being compassionate to, men to mental illness. But then, like, the critique that Derrida is launching here, right, is it not just at its essence, like, a critique of, as Pill said at the beginning, right, it's like, oh, you claim you're, like, escaping certain binaries or metaphysics, but you're actually not. You're doing metaphysics. And it's like, I mean, if, if that's right, then, like, I guess the other question might be, uh, like, from the perspective of what Eric and Matt were just talking about, like, so who cares if you're doing metaphysics? Yeah. Like, like I yeah. guess, so what's like, like, who cares? Like, why is that an important critique is the question. Or worse is Derrida's critique, like, harmful to that project of, of right. trying yeah. to so. be compassionate towards people. And I think part of Derrida's style is maybe to avoid something like that. So I want to hear Pills on this from from this because I can see him I can see him wincing a little bit. Well, if <laughs> if you want if you want to do the boil down critique that you just did, that's Foucault is saying we should be compassionate to crazy people. And again, every time we say crazy, it's in quotation marks. That's what the history of madness is about. But then someone else's then words. Derrida's response to it would be in the exactly same oversimplified, extremely crude uh, summary is then why are you writing philosophical papers about it? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sure. I agree. But I mean, it's worth noting that Foucault was actually Quite a bit of an activist scholar throughout his life, not always with the best causes. It's worth noting. There is nothing uh, outside the text. Yeah, I don't think that any. So, uh, so, so it's, I don't think any of us endorse Foucault's, you know, pro Iran uh, kind of flirtation for a little while there. But you know, people <laughs> have pointed out that this was uh, the book that made him famous, and part of it was because, as Eric said, uh, for a long time, mental illness had been seen as some kind of cognitive defect. Uh, you know, in some senses, people would say you're being infantilized if you have a mental illness, uh, and the fact that he was willing. Not to necessarily speak on to behalf of these people, but to at least raise the prospect uh, that something bad was happening to them, I think was really, in some ways, materially innovative, even if it's philosophically flawed in the ways that Derrida is talking about. And it's worth noting in the book, he says, look, I'm not trying, uh, as Derrida says, to romanticize madness or to suggest that there aren't some people, frankly, who have very serious medical issues uh, that need to be treated. What I'm just trying to say uh, as you know, Eric put it, uh, is that chaining people up onto walls and saying there's something wrong with the way you see the world and we cannot abide that in our society. And either you need to change to our way of thinking about things uh, or we're going to sh put you aside and not allow you to join civil society. That's wrong, right? Uh, I know Foucault doesn't use that word, but that's the kind of ethos that comes from the book. Uh, and if it kind of overemphasizes the point in the 1960s, which I think it does. Uh, I think maybe it needed to be overemphasized in this point just because so many people took the opposite tact for such a long period of time, right? Yeah. And you can see the kind of influence of it, like, as you mentioned, you know, Ken, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, the Ken Kenzie te Kessie text, right? This really had a revolutionary impact on culture, culture, where people all of a sudden, from novelist to Deleuze, would say things like, look, why shouldn't we think of aberrational ways of thinking as maybe having something to offer? Why should we treat this as a cognitive deviance uh, rather than maybe just a distinct way of apprehending the world that has something we could learn from, right? So it does open a kind of door to have a dialogue about this, at least. I mean, you you say that, and now you're presenting Foucault as some kind of activist, but as as you well know, he never says what to do about it. He, he knows, like a good Nietzschean, that that would be moralizing. And that's kind of at the root of the problem here. Don't look at me, I'm just a historian. But that's the bad philosophical position in this case. If, if this is actually a text about 
we should not treat people this way, then Derrida would not be deconstructing it because he only deconstructs philosophical texts that, you know, maintain a facade as if there's a center that we're, that we're being true to when there isn't one there or when you, you enable a contradiction. Yeah, that's the thing. Madness is a philosophically interesting concept. And the idea that rationality excludes the madness points to the idea that, you know, capitalism or modern philosophy or post-industrial revolution, you know, that that language of rationality is part of our institutional realities, right? Like these psychiatrists and all this juridical language that cements our laws and the ways we treat deviants it's all in there so Foucault's attempt to find not a history but an archaeology uh, this attempt to find a method that evades the sort of logic or language of reason and order is a philosophically important venture because yeah. you know if you like too often if you if you are like radically anti-capitalist or you're an activist of any kind you can be labeled as crazy as mad as insane and it's just a kind of it's kind of like a dog whistle to say that this person is not compliant this person is threatening the investments in our institutions and our social orders and this person needs to be stopped so it is philosophically interesting to try and find a language of how to talk about madness and that is i think derrida's exact point is that Foucault has initiated this enterprise, yeah. but in a way he's also failed spectacularly because this archaeology, I mean, it's got logos right in there. Mm -hmm. Does it really evade the problems that he sees with writing a quote unquote history, which would use the logic of order, what we were saying before, you know, the language of order, dividing, periodizing, making nice divisions? I, I agree 100%. The one thing that I'm going to foreground just you know, in part to be a shit disturber, because I think we need some back and forth on this, or we'll all disagree with Derrida, is I do think that Foucault is much stronger uh, in looking at the kind of material instantiations of these forms of knowledge power, to use his preferred term, than Derrida is. Uh, and one of the problems that I have with a lot of Derrida's texts is, brilliant as they are at locating those cracks in the philosophical edifice, you don't always see as much material analysis power dynamics, uh, or as much talk about how it is that certain kinds of human subjects are created by knowledge power, uh, as you do in Foucault. So I would say that in some ways, we do need a bit of Foucault with our Derrida. Uh, otherwise, we move too close to just talking about Descartes and thinking we can read the history of the institutionalization of badness through an interpretation of how it is that Cartesianism has spread through our culture. This right? echoes what uh, we read last week with Baudrillard saying, you're just reflecting capital. You're reflecting the totalization of capital. Derrida, yeah. what is this, 15 years before, writes uh, the infinite complicity in which Foucault compromises all those who understand their own language is basically the same thing. You can only denounce power from within power and by doing that, you're reasserting the same thing. So I wanted to introduce, I mean, we've talked we talked about it a lot last week as well, but like Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus on schizophrenia, that is a far better way to deal with uh madness, as we would call it. Madness instead of saying we're gonna romanticize this and call these people victims, anti-Oedipus offers a model by which Norm deviance is creative and productive. And I think Derrida would have been much more on board. I mean, he probably read yeah. it. I have never read him saying that he read it. But he'd be much more on board with that kind of approach than Foucault's pseudo-structural, I'm going to map out the history of knowledge and then read things, misread things so that they fit the narrative that I want to present, which is these people are victims, but no... We should go back to the original madness, the wild madness of the Greeks. And Derrida calls him out on that point too, saying, oh, you're just, you're doing the same thing that Nietzsche and Heidegger did, being we're going to go back to the originary unity of, of, of the Logos, where everything was right, happy Peter. and good. So there are ways to do this while taking the seriousness of the issue into account. 
when we're talking about Bedlam or whatever else. But Fu- or Derrida is taking specific yeah. issue with Foucault's monolith, his monolith institution. Um, I'm going to write this from the University of Paris type type approach. I'm going to write the history of the world, or the history of all of knowledge. And then Derrida asks him, what, you're going to write the history of the origin of history? Don't you understand how that's contradictory? Yeah. So you're right. I think everything you're saying, we should listen to you say, yes, this is this has material functions that we're not, that Derrida is not really paying attention to, but not, and not really addressing. But what Derrida is paying attention to is if you're going to write this way, then you're you're building up the thing that you're trying to tear down with your other hand. Yeah. yeah. I if there's someone right. you don't want to talk about origins with, it's definitely Derrida. And you have the RK in archaeology, right? Like we get words like archetype from that as well. It's a kind of origin and at the same time. Yeah, the, the leader of the old Greek uh, models of, of uh, civilization. And yeah, you really don't- It means don't the want- first, but it also means the dominant. It means both of those yeah, things. The, the primus, the alpha, like you don't want to have those conversations with Derrida because he'll just shut you right down. But I think some of Derrida's critique is wrapped up in the sorts of ways of Foucault's expression and the conceits of Foucault's work as well. Because Foucault's writing, madness is the subject of the book, so he's going to speak about it. But it's also the subject in the sense that he wants madness to speak. He wants to get it to be a first-person narrator in a sense, in his book. And this is a very strange conceit, and Derrida notices that it comes out in sort of two ways, that Foucault sometimes avoids using the language of reason and order, because in the institutional history of madness, those are gonna be connected with psychiatry, psychiatric medicine, and they're gonna be connected with theories of the body politic. And so he wants to avoid those in getting madness to speak for itself. And the second conceit is that he thematically connects madness with silence, which brings up the other problem of how do you get something which is silent to speak, which that without immediately entering into, again, the language of order and reason. So Foucault's trying to write an archaeology of silence, and Derrida's questioning whether Foucault is always successful at avoiding the language of order and escaping juridical and psychiatric language, and whether getting madness to speak, saying that madness, at some point in history, the origin of madness's silence is that reason tossed it out of the philosophical city and said, you're on your own now, Derrida kind of says you know Foucault's not very successful in framing that. And Derrida actually points to a secondary project that actually emerges behind Foucault's work, and it's to look at the root of both madness and reason in the Greek logos, and to question whether it was the Greek logos that instituted that that dif- difference, that decision as you'll call it in the first place, that separation of reason from madness, did did the Greek Logos institute it? And when I say Greek Logos, I'm really just talking about Plato and Socrates. Or did was the Greek Logos the originary ground, which would mean then it's not the origin. Then reason and madness were divided at some later point afterwards. And in terms of this is galaxy brained as hell, but in terms of the way that Foucault's expressing his whole idea of getting madness to speak for itself, this is a philosophical problem because it gets to the heart of the philosophy of language and deconstruction that Derrida takes through his whole career, right? And I do want to stress, just because our audience may not be familiar, um, it sounds like Foucault is just getting eaten alive here, but we have to remember this is only the... 1960 book um, that we're we're addressing here. He addresses a lot of the contentions that we're making in order of things and archaeology of knowledge later on, which are kind of answers to this. Yeah, and I want to say I do actually think that Foucault at his heart is a foundationalist of a certain sort in a way that Derrida never could be. Uh, and in fact, he doesn't quite state as such, uh, state um, that as such uh, in the order of things, becomes very close. So The Order of the Things uh, is probably his most important um, methodological book, that and the Archaeology of Knowledge, which is its direct sequel. Uh, and one of the things that he says uh, in The Order of Things is that uh, 
from now on, history is going to operate as a kind of or science, uh, which can arbitrate between all the other different kinds of knowledge because it takes a quasi dispassionate view uh, and can look at all of them at the same time in a way that they can. Uh, he later backs away from that strong claim in the archaeology of knowledge correctly, right? I think because he's aware of the implications of where he's going with that. Um, and then later on in um, Discipline and Punish, he says, I'm not going to really engage in this archaeology, uh, archaeological project any longer because it's too removed uh, from material analysis, interestingly enough, uh, to my point. So now instead, I'm going to be a genealogist uh, in a Nietzschean framework, and I'm going to be talking about the material instantiations of various forms of knowledge or power uh, in disciplinary institutions. And interpret uh, modernity in that way. Uh, but what's interesting about whether you it is whether you're doing an archaeology of knowledge uh, or a genealogical examination of knowledge power and its material instantiations is that he still can't get away from this idea that history is the or science, some kind of Foucauldian history. Uh, and I don't want to be too critical of him here because nobody wrote histories like Foucault, right? Uh, you'll never pick up a book uh, like Madness and Civilization and Discipline and Punish again. Very creative, very original, very innovative. Uh, but if you're determined to be an anti-foundationalist, I don't think he's the one that you want to go with. Um, as Eric and Pills both said, uh, anytime you start talking about urge origins or foundationalism or or sciences or whatever, they're going to come after you. And they do so rightfully uh, in this instance. But I, or I think the switch there that you mentioned from archaeology to genealogy was in response to a critique like this. Because uh, yeah, Derrida and Baudrillard are fundamentally saying the same thing about Foucault. And I think there's a mm -hmm. quote in here where Derrida says, this book is a gesture of internment. <laughs> so exactly the opposite. If you're hoping for liberation, he's saying, no, you're locking, you're locking everyone down into either the, posi the position of complicity, either you're complicit with repressing badness, or you're the mad who are repressed. And I was reading this, and uh, I, I'm also I'm almost loath to bring it up, but it's pretty much the uh, Jordan Peterson critique of <laughs> Foucault is that it's made to make make everybody feel guilty or and everybody else victims. But this is 1963, and uh, Derrida said the same thing. You're you're interning everybody mm -hmm. as either a perpetrator yeah. of violence or someone who violence is being done to and you can't speak, but then you're going to speak for them. And then Derrida goes, no, 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 you can't do that because speaking for them is the same violence that you're critiquing by putting it in mm. a knowledge structure. So when Foucault says, I'm going to go from knowledge structure to just tracing the genealogy of knowledge power, then he's trying to get out of that knowledge structure. Whether that's successful or not, we'll leave for another day. Baudrillard obviously thought it was I'm not. You're just replacing a new science system there. I'm going to say, though, I do think that this becomes a prevailing problem uh, for Derridian analysis going forward. Uh, so probably the paradigmatic paper in this vein uh, is actually in postcolonial theories. Uh, it's Gayatri Spivak, who was a Derridian, uh, paper, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, and her kind of conclusion is, no, we can't, right? Uh, anytime somebody presupposes mm -hmm. that they can speak for the subaltern, uh, they're, of course, taking their voice away from them, to put it really very simply, right? Uh, and so, therefore, uh, we can't ever engage in these kind of essentialistic projects uh, of deciding that this person or this figure or this group of figures even uh, can speak for a marginalized group, since that, of course, uh, silences other people uh, who might belong to that group. Even talking about them yeah. as a group is problematic. The difficulty with that guy that Spivak herself acknowledged by the time she gets to 1997's uh, Critique of Postcolonial Reason, which is a very difficult, dis uh, sorry, difficult book, is look, if we can never allow anyone to speak for these groups, then nothing is going to ever get done, right? Nobody is going to start our undertaking the critical project uh, since nobody's going to want to speak on behalf of anything. Uh, so then she starts to argue for a strategic essentialism as she talks about it, right? Uh, I will claim yeah. to be able to speak on behalf of X, even acknowledging the fact that I might not necessarily have that right for political purposes, right? So I do think the Derridian project winds up in a bind as well down the line. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, we could focus on that as well because I also uh, wrote a footnote in my notes to this because she was responding to criticism of her work yeah. Can the subaltern speak where she is speaking for the subaltern, then saying that the subaltern can't yeah, speak? Yeah, and I think this yeah, is the kind of no. <laughs> yeah, this is this is actually a crucial point where we have like theory. What can you say about history? What can you say about text? And then 
oh, if we're going to be true to to not being originary, not being uh, totalitarian with our ideas, then there's millions of people, living people who are trying to live their lives that are going to be left behind. But then the question comes yeah. back to what Derrida says in this book. What does writing a university paper or a book, a 673-page book, what does that do except change the minds, maybe change the minds, or just invoke responses from other people that are at the Sorbonne or the 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 Collège de France? Yeah, I agree with that. But I mean, this problem of essentialism uh, and the subaltern becomes a major issue for Derridian theory in more than just an academic uh, kind of context, right? Say I were to carry a placard uh, and march down the street right now saying, you know, uh, no justice for Palestine, right? Um, I'm essentially speaking uh, on behalf of a subaltern that I've assumed to have a certain knowledge for. They're not present, can't speak for themselves. Highly problematic in a lot of ways, especially as a Western trained academic uh, who's ever been to the Middle East. However, right, uh, a certain kind of strategic essentialism in this kind of circumstance might be useful uh, since by assuming that I can at least infer certain things about what's going on there and how the people as a whole are responding to it, uh, I might be able to agitate for a constructive political change by going and holding that placard up in front of Queens Park or whatever, right? Uh, and if I just were to sit there and say, I have no right to do that, uh, then what I'm going to end up doing is just staying at home and playing Warhammer Total War 2 in anticipation of Warhammer <laughs> Total War 3 coming out soon, right? Uh, so I think that there's a bind that we find ourselves in here, too. That's not just an intellectual one. It's also very adamantly political, since you can raise these kind of anti-essentialist Derridian points about any kind of political activism, not just intellectual political activism. Yeah, I think it's a really important point here, because the idea of archaeology as speaking for madness, but also being a way to get madness to speak and being against reason and order language... I mean, Derrida asks a question like, when's the responsibility of archaeology? And that's the central question here, responsibility, being able to speak for somebody else, but also, you know, have that little dash in there, response yeah, ability, yeah. someone else being able to also speak back, to speak for themselves, to leave room for a continuing dialogue and a response, in, in essence, right? That continuing relationship rather than just speaking for somebody and then that being the end of it you're their representative they're the they've delegated all agency to you to speak on behalf of them that's the question of archaeology here can archaeology escape the history which is you know a language of order can it really do that? And Derrida seems to think no, because he says an archaeology against reason, doubtless, cannot be written. For despite all appearances to the contrary, the concept of history has always been a rational one. It is the meaning of history or archaea that should have been questioned first. So he's saying, you know, he almost wants like a prolog a prolegomena, like a, a, mm. a question of like, what will our method be before we proceed. He wants Foucault, to, he's almost like writing that for Foucault. And then later on, he says, well, actually, now this second project emerges. But here, it's it's a writing that exceeds by questioning them, the values of origin, reason, and history. They cannot be contained within the metaphysical closure of an archaeology. That's, that's Derrida's kind of just saying, this this can't be done. You've you've failed to live up to your own project here. But I mean, like, I do think he acknowledges <laughs> that later on, though, why, which is why the genealogical transition happens, right? Like he gives up yeah. on this project eventually. Yeah. So it's always weird the roots and the ways that we come to take in the criticisms that people lay out against us. It's kind of strange because we kind of have to come to them ourselves. And I guess Foucault's like that. He's a bit combative, so he never takes it in. He always responds and rebuffs but then later on it's like he starts thinking uh, yeah okay i can work this in somehow and then and then by a circuitous route he ends up actually taking on the criticisms that were initially launched against him after ignoring them for 20 years speaking of which <laughs> after speaking being of palestine <laughs> because uh Deleuze supported palestinian resistance foucault didn't talk to him for 20 years as well really uh it's Foucault a, was a yeah, he never was a, ending story. <laughs> a cat fight. That's why it makes a good series. Yeah, he was a, a touchy man. It never ends. 
But yeah, I, I mean, I'm picturing Derrida is like Derrida the Grey walking into Foucault the White's Tower of Discourse and saying, <laughs> when did Foucault the Rise abandon reason for madness? Ah! And then like all that goes down, then Derrida gets launched to the top of the tower. Did you see that? There's another quotation in here where he said, um, this, this book was Foucault writing for himself to not go mad. He was writing against the, the fear of going mad or something. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's funny. I like it. Makes my quote op- apropos. Like, I just want to say, like, about pop culture references, right? Like, I do understand what he's saying, though, uh, Derrida, about, you know, these kind of cheesy Western people who will assume that they can speak for whatever you want to call it, the subaltern, uh, people in developing countries, you know, whatever. Um you know, you can think about like those crappy 80s pop songs, you know, where Bono and Michael Jackson would get together and be like, we've never been to Africa, but we do know that it's really poor. So we're going to sing We Are the World and that'll make everything better. We'll just have a rock concert. Um, you know, this kind of activity is extremely insulting uh, and very patronizing to these people and their lived experiences. Right. So I do think it's important to point out that that's not what we should be doing. We shouldn't be romanticizing the mad, romanticizing people living in other countries in precarious conditions, whatever. Uh, I just think it's too much to go the opposite direction, say that, wow, we should just sit there and endlessly think about what the right way to speak for them will be rather than actually doing something. But that isn't uh, a critique. We're kind of we're kind of bastardizing it to the point where it's not even correct anymore. I know. Well, now I'm just talking about crappy 80s pop songs because I want to bring that up. What, what Derrida's objection is, just to restate it, is that we, you're re-interning that distinction. You're recreating that distinction and even assuming that that distinction occurred in Descartes or Cartesian philosophy. Saying, look, we can point to it. Okay, now we have an enemy. It's Descartes and anyone who follows Descartes. Now we have everybody on that side. Now I'm going to be the virtuous philosopher and go to the other side and speak for the silent. And Derrida's point is you're not doing that. You're not doing the thing that you're saying you're doing. Yeah, I told you, I completely agree with this paper and his criticism, right? I think that any reading of Descartes that's actually moderately charitable will showcase that he's not a monological figure who says that reason is self-validating and it all needs to come from the subjective Cartesian ego. Uh, Right from the very get-go, as Derrida points out, uh, there was the possibility of deconstructing this project since Descartes foregrounds uh, the possibility of skepticism towards reason very, very prominently. And this just gets effaced in this Foucauldian history. And, you know, fair enough. But if you keep focusing on the Descartes part, then you're still going to miss the point of why Derrida is bringing up Descartes. I'm, uh, there was a, there's a lot of relevant references to this in terms of the way that scholarship is done today and even just like uh, non-academic discourse. But when it concerns total power structures like uh, patriarchy or capitalism then they're presented also in such a way where you must take the RK side or not. But if you, if you instantiate, if you give people only that choice, like you're either on one side of this binary or the other, the binary itself is the thing that never comes into question. And you see this misreading when, when we say all of, all of history is this, like Descartes been accused of a bunch of different things, but it could be like, D- Descartes used only masculine pronouns, so he's a member of the patriarchy. He's reinstantiating it in the same way that Foucault reads, misreads. Sorry, Descartes on madness. This is a way that scholarship is done now, following Foucault, saying you're on the bad side of the binary, and I am on the good side of it, and that is the the crux of what this article is arguing against. So I think it has a lot more to say than even what we've we've brought up so far. In if you if you esta- or establish reestablish the binary and put yourself on the good side, then you're complicit in that thing existing. And it's not like we can all be Derridians because there wouldn't be enough time. But uh, that criticism holds well to a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of colonialism. Would be another one. It's just like this ur giant unstoppable force when if you look down every reality like that every reality that presents itself as total always has its cracks in it it always has opportunities for resistance um it's just that i don't know creativity is at an all-time low now so i don't think that's as fun as trying to trying to own people okay i 100 percent agree that 
I mean, I know a lot of them, and I know uh, Victor does also, right? There are a lot of Foucaultians out there. There are a dime a dozen who do adopt this kind of victim-oppressor binary um, you know, straight from these kind of texts and say, you're on the good side or the bad side, so let's be on the good side and speak for the people on the good side. A hundred percent. I do just want to say, though, that I don't think that that is Foucault's approach because he makes it very clear, uh, even in this text, that he's not trying to actually romanticize madness in the way that Derrida is accusing him. Uh, it's not a very compelling response right now, but later on as his work develops, by the time you get to the late period, he says, look, the entire thing that I'm trying to get across is that power pervades all the different social relations, which is problematic for the reasons Baudrillard points out in our discussion last week. Uh, but, you know, we can have productive forms of power that also exist that allow us to create new subjectivities, you know, new kinds of modes of life uh, that won't necessarily be as determined uh, by these disciplinary forms of power uh, that force us to inhabit subjectivities that we don't wish to, right? Uh, and I do think that this is more emancipatory uh, and less binary uh, than the kind of people who've appropriated Foucauldian tropes in his name, right? Uh, so let's bash on all the shitty Foucauldians out there, but at least acknowledge that the man himself uh, seemed to be cognizant of some of these problems and did respond to them throughout the course of his Dude, life. Dude, no, this is not a knock against Foucauldians. This is Derrida's knock against Foucault that we just read. It's already in there. So whether or not he changed it up, or whether or not he responded 15 years later after the fact, is a different story. I'm not poisoning the well here. This is what Derrida saw there right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is too simplistic, but what I see happening here, and what Pills was saying with the kind of the bastardized kind of binarism that some Foucauldians adopt. Like, Derrida's point I'm here not even isn't... saying Foucauldians, just dividing people into the A people and the B people. The B people are bad because they have power. The A people are good because they don't have power. B exploits A. We're on the side of A, so we are thus good as well. Yeah, I mean, sure, those people, like, they had their window open, it was windy, and a few pages of what is an author blew in, and they, <laughs> they looked at them, and whatever, and, and, and now they have this, this whole-scale interpretation of history and everything else. Like, what Derrida is pointing out here is that neither reason nor, nor madness are, neither is more original than the other. Because whenever you have a binary, right, you have to look at the difference. You have to get between them and talk about difference. I mean, this is exactly what Heidegger does with the ontological difference, right? It's not that the ontic is more important or the ontological is more important. The important point is the ontological difference. What that points to is that there must be a more original ground on which that difference was launched or instituted or made, right? Because when we try to point out one as being the original and the other one as being the derivative, the unmarked one of the binary, right? The marked or the marked side of the binary, the marked is different. The difference itself is what's important. And that's why, hence, Derrida's, you know, difference, right? It also kind of has a temporal dimension to it as well, not just a distinction, but it's there's there's a more original ground on which the difference is made. And that's where we have to get to. And Foucault's kind of there at the threshold saying, you know, there was a distinction, a decision made to cast out madness from the city of philosophical reason. What Derrida is trying to take it a step further and say that that difference itself has a ground. And that's where we have to get to. We have to get back even further so that the binary, again, doesn't just become this unexamined given that it's also something contingent and we have to move through it in order to get to it so that an archaeology doesn't do that archaeology just reproduces exactly what it seeks to evade which is again reason order and the language of logos and it does that precisely by pointing to decision you kind of glossed over the word but it's really important is that or you look, you look back sense. in history to when the decision was made, for whatever, for the decision for when, when men were superior to women, and then that was the case forever after that, or whatever, whatever oppression version, uh, colonizers colonized. And for Derrida, that's the error that archaeology makes. It's saying, let's look for the decision, because that's the moment when everything changed, when every everything orbits that decision moment. So if we can find it, in this case, if we can find it in Descartes, then we can 
you know, speak for the side of the oppressed. And it's really important so, yeah. for Derrida to say that decision is not real. That's part of you privilege or privileging history as this sequence of events as if that's what happened. That there's one decision, and if we could go back there and undo that bad thing that we did, then everything would be gone. And that's just not the case. So I, I do want to push back on this a little bit by saying that I absolutely agree that, that what's Der- that's what Derrida is trying to do. Uh, but it's not like he hasn't had his interpreters who've read a philosophy of history, uh, a kind of cheesy philosophy of history into his own work. Uh, you could find people who will say that the whole history of, for instance, Western or European philosophy is just a logocentric mistake uh, that we now need to overcome, which is similarly reductive, right? Uh, and it's important to note that every now and then Derrida does write uh, as if that is the case in of grammatology, right? Where he's talking about the problems of the metaphysics of presence uh, and why we need to now wean ourselves off uh, these kind of ontological conceits, which is a point he picks up from Heidegger, as you point out. Uh, so I think we can forgive Foucault occasionally lapsing in uh, to these kinds of problems because it's not like Derrida, and I think Derrida was more overt about this, uh, was immune uh, from giving in to these kinds of structuralist or transhistorical or ultra-historical temptations. Okay, you're wrong. Sorry, this is important though. You're reading the conclusion as if it were the method. And the critique of presence is not historicized. That's why he reads texts, particular texts. Heidegger did that. Yeah, I grant you that. But Derrida does not historicize so sir when he's critiquing the metaphysics of presence. I think he absolutely did. I mean, if you read of grammatology, there's a very clear philosophy of history that's geni- uh, that's genetic. It's not it, a philosophy right? of uh, history. Much- he reads individual texts and points out the presence in each one. That's it. It's a re- yeah. But again, I think that yeah. it's, it's very easy to read a philosophy of history into that, and people have since then. Because- well, then they have, but he didn't write it in there. Yeah, but again, this is the point that I'm trying to get at, right? Foucault has sometimes been misinterpreted as effectively a structuralist thinker who's reading these binaries into everything when the reality because is that his work did. is more complicated. Because he did. You read the same article I did. I think that if you were to look at of grammatology, you can kind of see the Heideggerian history of metaphysics uh, latent within it. And it's not very difficult to interpret the book in that way. And so what I'm trying to point out is that the same way that Foucault wasn't entirely able to wean himself off of these temptations or difficulties, so neither was Derrida, right? Uh, the whole history of a metaphysics of presence, right, is a very grandiose idea that's very that's easy. That's not even of- a critique. You're not even giving me anything <laughs> to look at. You're just generalizing a text about someone who's always very specific. Okay, well, then I'll give you a very clear example, right? Uh, so he points out that the metaphysics of presence uh, and the supposition uh, that there has to be something here uh, is always latent in many different, particularly modern philosophical thinkers, right? Uh, and what's always being excluded by this, of course, is all the potential things that could deconstruct what's present uh, and demonstrate that it's essentially withholding uh, something important uh, that might actually tell us a lot more uh, about how the world actually is, if you want to call it that, or the more interesting way to look at the text, uh, if you prefer the parlance. Uh, And this is, again, very much a Heideggerian project where Heidegger will say things like, if you look at the kind of history of being uh, from Plato going forward, uh, what we see is a gradual forgetting of the ontological question in favor of trying to assert that being is something, right? Being is mind, or being is spirit, or being is history, right? Um, All of which is about what I'm trying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so what I'm trying to say is that this kind of history of philosophy that Heidegger developed is mapped into the kind of history of logocentrism and the metaphysical presence that you see in Derrida's Which own Derrida work. critiques. And even if he, yeah, which he does critique. Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm just trying to say is that like, it's not like he was he, incapable of making very broad, very sweeping statements about the history You're of philosophy. You're still confusing a methodology with his laboriously drawn conclusions and taking one for the other. Even when he's 33, Derrida is not one to make broad statements about history. He absolutely did. What else are you going to talk about when you talk about a metaphysics of presence, right? That's the conclusion, not the method. I mean, here's here's bringing it back, right? What Metaphysics... When Derrida gets his hands on it, it's a critique of this distinction between presence and absence. And presence is the valued side of the binary, and absence, or absence, sorry, is is the unvalued, the marked side, right? The origin is always 
absent. But the way that metaphysics works is it, it's a little bit like ideology. It covers up its own origins, right? It covers up the way that it works and just makes you think that the given, this binary distinction with the valued and the unvalued side is all that we have to work with. It goes back to that, right? So I think what Derrida is doing here is, is pointing that out in Foucault and saying we need to be aware of this and then let's push this in a little bit further. And so he calls for a new project that locates the original ground that united reason and madness in the first place, in which that decision that Foucault points out could actually take root in the first place. And he says the attempt to write the history of the decision, division, difference, runs the risk of construing the division as an event or a structure subsequent to the unity of an original presence, thereby confirming metaphysics in its fundamental operation. And I think he's saying that metaphysics kind of covers itself up as it presents itself to us, right? Like the metaphysics of presence is the same thing as saying speech is better than words written on a piece of paper, right? I read a book and I want to know what it means. I interpret it and we disagree. So let's go ask the author. Let's bring the author here and the author can speak and the author is the authority on their text. Again, that's, a, that's accepting this metaphysical binary that writing is less valuable than speech, that presence is more authoritative than absence. But the absence part is what Derrida And that's exactly on. what I'm Again, saying. Just right? like he focuses on that, writing. You know, there are a million Derridians out there I can think of who would say, Spivak is a very good example, right? Who will sit there and say, look, when we look at the history of metaphysics, uh, of Western metaphysics and this idea of presence and absence, right? Uh, what is considered to be present is always given a privileged position in positions uh, in systems of power. So therefore, we should probably take the side of what's being repressed, if you want to use the second No, one. we should not probably take a side. You're trying to both yeah, exactly. sides Derrida okay. and Foucault when the topic of this freaking article is how one correctly points out that that is what the other is yes, doing. Yes, yes. Hey. And you're just doing the bad reading now that you say bad Derridians are doing. Okay, no, I'm not letting this go. And precisely the mistake is that you can never invert a binary to undo the, the decision. Yeah, taking the side of, I guess. Foucault does that literally with madness. Hello, everyone. I'm an archaeologist, and today I'm going to speak for madness. I'm going to make it the privileged term now. I don't, I don't care if Jordan Peterson or you misrepresent you me. You're just okay, trying yes, to say, exactly. oh, it's all right because everybody's inconsistent. But no, he exactly. isn't. Yes, not but what on I'm saying is point. people make exactly the same accusations toward Derrida later on, right? That so what this if they is just do? a kind of Heideggerian history written with a kind of acknowledgement of Caesarian linguistics, and it really is as beholden to the history of idealism as Heidegger's history of metaphysics is. And I don't think that that's a fair criticism. It's not a fair criticism, but what I'm just saying- why are you even bringing it up? I'm not saying that. Because I'm just saying that we can give Foucault a pass for sometimes writing in a certain way uh, that would lead to these kinds of bad interpretations that you're talking about. And in the same way, we should appreciate that Derrida could sometimes write in a way that can and has led to people interpreting him in a similarly bad way, right? So I'm just saying, let's not be- But so are you saying that Foucault is just, that, that, that it's only because of the way Foucault wrote, but not his intention? I mean, I thought I, I there was an establishment that Foucault actually made some philosophical errors here and like wasn't, wasn't actually I, I achieving he a, what a, he said he was gonna achieve, whereas, Derrida, I mean, the claim is like I'm as I, I've been pretty silent here because I just don't know Derrida that well, so I don't have like I can't really speak that much to him. But I know that um, the claim it sounds like what Pills is saying is like you know he's actually always tr been true to his method. So like people may misinterpret him, but he didn't he didn't make any errors because he achieved what he said he was trying to achieve. At least that's the claim. Well, I don't necessarily think that that's entirely fair though. Uh, again, because if you look at madness and civilization, right? Again. Uh, the accusation that Foucault is romanticizing the mad uh, or setting up a binary where we should take the side of the victim against so-called oppressors, right, uh, is something that he's very explicit we should not do, right? He says uh, in the intro, we need, I am going to hear, speak for the silent. Yeah, he's going to speak for the silent, but that doesn't necessarily mean endorsing the views of the silent. What he's essentially saying is that there's been a privileged history that's been given thus far. It's a history of reason and reason's triumph. And now I'm going to show how it is that a system of power was set up that created this kind of purview, this kind of outlook, uh, and then be critical of it, right? But that doesn't mean that we should necessarily take the side of the mad against the defenders of so-called reason. It's just to recognize that this binary is highly problematic as a system of, pine, uh, of power and domination. 
right? Uh, and I think, again, if you look at the way that Derrida approaches the history of presence and the metaphysics of presence in of grammatology, there is sometimes a binary at work that you could similarly exploit for political purposes by saying that, oh, Derrida is taking the side of women and femininity uh, against masculinity and toxic conceptions of masculinity, which many feminist theorists have tried to do, right? I think that that's a misreading of what Derrida is trying to accomplish, right? Since the point isn't to privilege one side of this binary over the other, but it does sometimes lend itself to that interpretation in the same way reading Madness and Civilization would lend itself to the interpretation, oh, Foucault wants us all to go drop acid and be crazy for a couple of hours, as fun as that might be, right? So I'm just trying, if anything, to say, if we're going to give Der like Foucault shit for sometimes writing in this way that would lend itself to, as you yourself put it, Bills, these bad interpretations, right? We should also acknowledge that there are a lot of bad interpretations of Derrida out there. And if you were to read of grammatology carelessly enough, it would lend itself and has lent itself to those bad interpretations as well. That sure was a lot of words. Um, I'm, I think I've said my piece on this and I don't want to belabor it anymore. Uh, Eric? <laughs> No, oh, I think Foucault certainly is going to claim that Derrida misread him and misread his interpretation of Descartes and shouldn't have focused on that in the first place. Which we'll have to see next week. Can I, can I yeah. just ask a question, though, here about, uh, like, you know, I mean, I feel a bit like, uh, you know, that t I felt, feel a little bit like that kid in the class who didn't do his homework because I just do not know Derrida's philosophy well enough. And, like, you know, just reading this one paper wasn't really enough for me to... But I'm but I'm curious, like that. you know, I mean, I've heard, I've I've read this a couple times, uh, like, or I've heard, I've read about this a couple times, right? This kind of like deconstruction of binaries as being kind of one of the 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 touchstones of of Derrida's thinking, and I I mean, maybe this isn't answerable right now, but you know, what's, I mean, I guess it just seems like as someone who doesn't know Derrida, like kind of just like a, an obvious thing that like binaries are bad, that they can be distorting of reality that they like can kind of, can kind of like guide us into, to like kind of simplifying and, uh, you know, kind of obfuscating thinking. So like, but I guess, so like what's novel about like, I mean, like, is it just the method with which he does it with like his kind of deconstructive tactic where he reveals the inconsistencies of the binaries? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to give it a really sort of straightforward because it, yeah it's not straightforward Derrida avoids taking positions that's the sort of point of deconstruction but I think the idea is that when you write something in a structuralist vein you think that afterwards once you've set up all the binaries once you've made all the distinctions once you've erected the structure that's the explanatory apparatus and then now there's some other object which that explains and what Derrida does is he goes the opposite direction and he shows you that how when we, we look at a structure say you, you go outside and you look at a building and you assume that oh that must have like a center of force a center of gravity and all of those binaries and all of those relationships that are holding together are actually all fixed by this center of the structure and what deconstruction does is it goes and it shows you how each binary depends on another one depends on another one depends on another one until you get to a point where okay there must be a center to all of this. And then you go there and look, and behold, there is no center. It's an aporia. It's a fiction, in a way. And so, in a sense, what happens during the time you're erecting one of these explanatory apparatuses is the thing that you think is doing the explanation, at some point, becomes the thing that needs to be explained. And Derrida points out that moment, and you see that moment in archaeology, the method itself. It reveals, and in this passage, which condenses the entire essence of the work, Derrida claims, this passage on Descartes that Foucault writes, this condenses that entire structure into this central point, and then Derrida looks at it and says, the center is not the center. The center is actually outside of the structure. It's somewhere else, which is why he says that we need this new project of locating this original ground. And then when we get where reason and madness came from in the first place, and then likely, once we get there, if we could locate this original ground, whether it's in classical philosophy or whether it's in the pre-Socratics, those things that Nietzsche and Heidegger were so interested in, whether it's there, whether we get there, we'll probably find that there's no center there either. And it becomes this endlessly referring sort of structure that deacon and the deconstructive method is meant to reveal that, get behind it, 
get under it and restore the sort of explanatory apparatus to the position, clearly, of the thing that actually needs to be explained, right? So what's the relationship between that approach, which seems to not want to take a stance on anything, right, and kind of reveal how, like, fundamentally the categories we use, the binaries we use are just self-referential to other binaries that rely on other binaries, which ultimately leads to, like, an aporia? You know, I guess it's just, so what's the, you know, is is there a, what's the relationship between that and praxis or action? Eric, I, first of all, I thought that was a brilliant explanation. Thank you. Um, But when it comes to practice, I think Derrida better than anybody knows what he is. He's a French intellectual studying history, studying the history of thought in an institution. And that's the thing that he writes about. So later on, when in the 90s, he does move more towards practice when he's writing about uh, hospitality and things like that. But at the right. basic term, the, the huge problem, with a, which I think Eric did a great job of explaining, is when you build, when you have a binary, you say this binary is bad, then you just flip it over. Then you have a brick, and then you just add more bricks to that. So then you're just developing an anti-system that in every way is eventually going to resemble the thing that you're trying to replace, the tra- thing you're trying to fix. Right. So when you're trying to say... We can't read dead white males in universities. We should have a, a class that's exactly all non-white males to like counterbalance them. Yeah, I guess that would. I mean, I think that might be a crude example because I can see no, I can see example, uti- I util ways of using that. But if you build a system that's exactly the old system on its head, you're still not getting to the distinction, the orbit that those things are built on. And then you have other things that are built on those distinctions. So he says in uh, the essay right before this one in this book, uh, Writing Indifference, that all of philosophy is basically a history of light because the light, the Plato's cave metaphor, light was the very first distinction. Darkness is bad. Darkness is ignorance. Light is knowledge. Light is good. Keep in mind there that he's not saying history is a history of light, but the history of written textual philosophy. Now we have this original metaphor that does not occur in the world, but in text. And then the rest of text is added to onto that, elaborating the first metaphor. And then light becomes associated, you know, in enlightenment with rationality, reason, intelligibility, clarity, and so on. Then when it comes to practice, um, Derrida's mostly quiet on that. And again, uh, to reiterate, the reason is because I think he knows what he's doing. He's a writer of books dealing with other books. And I think asking the question of practice is not at all a, a bad question, but it's it's saying your your practice that is not writing books is going to be different from your practice of writing books. So I think this we could even bring this back to the Derrida mentioning McLuhan a whole bunch of times. You, he knows what his medium is, and he knows what Foucault's medium is. But Foucault doesn't know what Foucault's medium is. Foucault thinks he's being an activist and a philosopher at the same time. And I think that's where Derrida goes. You're crossing, you're crossing paths in your own brain, and it's not working because you're not doing one or the other when you think you're doing both. So I'll give you a bad Derridian interpretation of a uh, bad fe- Derridian feminist take uh, of the sort that I was being critical of versus a good one, Judith Butler's. Right, a bad Derridian feminist take uh, would say something exactly on the lines of what Pills and Eric are talking about. Right. Uh, that through the history of Western thought, what we've seen is the privileging of a masculist viewpoint uh, over a feminine one, right? Uh, so in order to overcome this kind of dilemma, what we need to do is reemphasize the position of women uh, and their kind of distinct outlook on the world, right? Uh, that'd be a very classical way of misreading somebody like Derrida, right? Exactly the way that Pills was talking about. A good reading, though, uh, would be somebody like uh, Judith Butler's in Gender Trouble, where she draws directly on Derrida by saying, the problem with doing exactly that uh, is, as Pills was saying, uh, what you essentially allow yourself to do is let patriarchy decide how it is uh, that you're going to express your femininity, because you're just 
expressing it in response to the presence of patriarchy in your society and in the history of Western thought, right? Uh, so you haven't actually overcome patriarchy. All that you've done is allow it to determine your responsiveness to it. Uh, so the more truly feminist act wouldn't be to foreground the position of women relative to men, uh, but to try to deconstruct the gender binary as a whole, which is, of course, what she does in Gender Trouble by saying, why do we need to have a masculine perspective or a feminine perspective? Uh, why can't we just see gender as something that's entirely performative, right? Uh, the result. Right, right. I, I get that. I get that. I get that. And like, you know, I mean, the one thing about Gender Trouble, though, it's as much as it's as much a, a Derridian book as it is a Lacanian book to some extent, which is kind of a structuralist view, too. So kind of I mean, I think maybe that complicates the story like slightly just because she I don't think that that Judith Butler is committed to deconstruction. Right. Sure. I mean, she, she's got like a quite. But but in any case, the reason is the, the gender that's binary the practice, practical side to it. Right? But the, the gender binary thing is interesting. But I mean, the, the thing is, I always find like, you know, getting beyond binaries. It's like I think I, it just sometimes seems to me that um, uh, it, like there, there's a kind of um, uh, a paralysis that can occur when you just when you when you can't talk about when you can't use words to talk about things anymore because they will invoke some binary. And it's like uh, it's just it becomes sometimes it can become absurd when it, these bad, as you say, versions of, of, of like being skeptical of whatever binary. It's like, OK, well, we can't describe anything because it's going to invoke and we have to stay pure away from these. We have to like stay in some aporia because we can't fall into these binaries that lead into anything it just kind of feels like it can lead to kind of paralysis and like which again seems to interfere with praxis is kind of where i'm getting at i mean yeah it's hard even when language is implicated though though we don't have to be overly concerned about the signification of words at all times though it's just as a philosopher who's trying to write something about what's true non-arbitrarily that's a specialized kind of language so if you want to be some sort of activist then do that on your own time, you know? It's a separate aim. The medium of that type of speech is not concerned with what's non-arbitrarily true, at least not primarily. So to go back to last week, this whole May 68 thing is how do we, right. how do, we yeah. do politics once the French Marxist party has failed at politics? Do we just rebuild the new, new French Marxist party? Or do we act as philosophers on one hand and then be activists on another hand? And Derrida is very clear, I think, about saying when you're writing philo philosophically specifically, then you don't want to reinstantiate the thing that you're trying to undermine while you're trying to undermine it. If you're doing a different kind of writing, then you're probably doing something different. If you're writing a manifesto, you're not doing philosophy in that way but what Derrida deconstructs is always these these um, non-self-conscious writings of histories that find origins that find kernels that are never questioned that's always the thing that he reads he's not reading like the newspaper and deconstructing it right yeah yeah I, I do think that this yeah. is a problem think, though go ahead it, Eric you can go I was just going to say, I think another interesting example might be the sort of theism atheism binary. Yeah. Because when you had atheism coming around in the 20th century, I mean, I'll just start the story with the, you know, the four horsemen of the, of new atheism, right? Like, how can someone like Jordan Peterson, who's clearly not an atheist, like coexist with them on the, on IDW so comfortably? Because all he's really doing is just, Again, just reversing that same binary that the atheists originally reversed, right? Like science, the coming of science means the fading of relevance of religious institutions and religion. So let's all be atheists and science will get us there. And then by the time of the new atheists, that position is extremely solidified, but it's simplistic. It's just emphasizing the other side of the binary and it just reflects the structure of theism. And then all you have to do to be Jordan Peterson is to come around and say the same things that they are, but just flip the binary again. And you don't have anything new happening because they haven't deconstructed the position in the first place. They've just reversed it. And now they're selling books like mad and banking on it. It's another, maybe hmm. another, yeah. Der a Derridian could uh, maybe have a field day with that one too. Yeah. I do want to say though, Victor, I, I actually agree with you, which is kind of what I was gesturing to you in the middle of this before we went on a kind of attack on Derrida. I wouldn't um, call it that. Discussion. But like, <laughs> I do think that there are limitations to this 
approach to things because uh, I think I'm more hostile to it than someone like Pills is. Uh, and one of the limitations is political, which I think even Derridians acknowledge today, people like Spivak, right? Uh, and for that matter, uh, as you pointed out, Butler, right, who gradually kind of moved away uh, from a more Derridian uh, to a kind of more psychoanalytic perspective. Uh, and it precisely uh, is this, right, that if we can't necessarily assume to speak on behalf of some kind of essentialized identity category, women, men, you know, colonize, colonizer, whatever, right? Uh, it makes it very mo difficult to mobilize uh, on behalf of polit constructive political projects. Uh, and this is something that you know, people like Martha Nussbaum um, and Catherine McKinnon would point out, right? Uh, if the category of woman becomes so erased in somebody like Judith Butler's work, how is it that we can even have a feminist movement any longer, right? What is it even speaking well, for? Well, could also, could, could, and you know, I think we all love uh, Zizek and we're all sympathetic to Lacanian psychoanalysis. And obviously we're like, I mean, we're already at an hour 35 minutes, by the way, but you know, I'd be interested uh, to know, like, uh, how can, like, kind of a Derridian approach to philosophy also coexist with the Lacanian approach, which seems to me to be quite structural and uh, built on a number of binaries, but uh, I don't know, and concepts. I was already thinking, I was already thinking, not with Lacanian psychoanalysis, but with post-Frankfurt school critical theory, is that the reason that Derrida occupies such a different sort of area of critical theory is because there is not like an explicit politics there whereas in the frankfurt school critical theory there is an explicit politics and it's very explicit but with even with someone like yeah so i'll give you that that yeah politically it could be a problem post-structuralism has tendencies towards a kind of political quietism not that foucault really has a much better politics being as like structuralism and linguistics oh, in general yeah. does not have a much better politics than post-structuralism does. So, I mean, yeah, you can argue that Derrida doesn't really have an explicit politics, and he really does try later, as yeah. Pills was pointing out, to have a more sort of active approach to his concepts like ethics, hospitality, and responsibility. But, you know, take that for what it is. No, you're but totally structuralists right. structuralists don't seem to either, so it's not really a point for Foucault either. No, no, you're right. You're right that uh, that I think Foucault also can lead to a kind of quietism as well, just yeah, as just or as like much a nihilism, a nihilism or a kind of that endlessly referring, winding structure. It doesn't lead to any sorts of concrete conclusions. I mean, does, isn't this kind of a problem with uh, with some like maybe this is an like a, a kind of uh, thing that seems to be a recurring thing in some kind of continental what we would call continental approaches to to, to philosophy or metaphysics that like it can because it's so fixated on trying to push the limits of like of all concepts and all stabilizing kind of points of reference like they always want to trouble every single archimedean point of reference that i think inevitably they sometimes end up leading to this kind of like well, what the fuck do we do now yeah, i like, mean it is a destruction of tradition the main gesture is against that stability because that stability always ends up being coercive though so the reason that they can't get to something like that, that is they don't want to reintroduce coercion into their social structure. Yeah, I mean, I I, I will just say quickly that I I don't I, you know I'm not really I get that that's the reason why uh, these continental approaches are doing it. I understand that the intention is behind like this fear of of the authoritarianism of categories and all this stuff. But I guess I'm you know I'm not all that convinced. Uh, I think there's alternatives to just. Uh, trying to you know like uh, eliminate and be stay pure from any sort of Archimedean, Archimedean point of, of there's a way I guess I guess like me you know if I was to sort of off the cuff say what like what, what I think my approach to these kinds of things is it's like you just have to treat these points of reference as much more contingent and kind of open to revision uh that's that seems like and use them but just they're always open to question always open to revision as opposed to just being like well I have to try to escape them or yeah whatever. that's Baudrillard's claim too, just to re bring it up, is if you tr if you're so oh, against stability that you say this is all flows, it's all difference, we can't like get our hands on anything solid, we just need to keep exchanging things, then you're just mirroring capital too. So if you go too far the other right. direction, you're in exactly the same wash. Anyway, we have to call okay, it cool. there. Uh, it's yeah. <laughs> it's been a no molar. Get rid it's of the molar. It's been a long one. Um, I don't know if if you got. I thought this was a knockout. I thought this was a round one knockout, and then he kept beating on him for another uh, thirty eight pages. <laughs> but uh, what what did you guys think? Did we was this a knockout or are we being too hard? 
I mean, I think it's based on the criteria for which he was critiquing him. Like, I think it probably, I mean, it was, I mean, I think it seemed right to me that he didn't, that he, he identified the ways in which Foucault wasn't doing what he said he was doing, like, or wasn't achieving that, that end goal. I think that's right. To me, it's like when, when uh, Foucault is standing in front of the enemy and he's fighting him and the enemy is reason, and then Derrida comes up behind Foucault and just sort of skewers them both at the same time with the same sword and was just like, thanks, Foucault, you did half the work for me. Here's the finishing blow. Totally. <laughs> and boom. So Foucault, you know, like he gets so much credit for it. But it, yeah, I think it's it's pretty devastating as well. But I, would, I wouldn't say Foucault is... I mean, Foucault's still like the sort of mountain you have to climb before you slide down the Deridian fun slide <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, um, I've never read Foucault's response to this, uh, but we are going to read it for next week. So until then, peace out from the Pill Pod. Take it easy. Don't binary. Later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye, Nary. Fire and brimstone. Fatality.